Thank you so much for joining BTI's Market Outlook and Client Service Review for 2019. We're excited that you were able to join us, and uh, we have a lot of things we want to talk about this afternoon. Before we get started, um, I'm sure you've all read the intro slides. Uh, my partner, Jen Dizo, will have the much more difficult job than I will today of answering questions and responding uh, to you uh, through the chat box. Also like to uh, thank Joy Harnwa, who also plays a pivotal role in making this happen. And uh, also a special thank you to the uh, folks mainly in the Midwest, where I understand it is about minus 18 or 20 in Milwaukee. Um, many of the offices are closed, so um, they're dialing in and logging in from home, and we appreciate it. We've got about 1,600 uh, individuals uh, joining us today, and as we're getting started, you're seeing a picture of you, uh, Walter White, who most of you recognize from Breaking Bad, and if you're wondering why we would begin uh, this uh, broadcast with a picture of Walter White. As many of you know who've watched Breaking Bad, his alias was Heisenberg. And Werner Heisenberg is generally regarded as the father of uncertainty. And he proved mathematically that you can't measure the location and momentum of a particle at the same time, and actually at the same time created what's now known as quantum physics. So, we're going to focus on this uncertainty because this uncertainty is one of the biggest drivers in the marketplace that we have seen and uh, in about the 19 years we've been doing this. If you look at the spending patterns going all the way back to 2001, we're going to kind of start our spending pattern journey, if you will, to um, look and see right in these years here. Starting in 2016, there was a fairly noticeable and increasing spend in outside counsel. The bottom half of each column is the spending on outside counsel. The top is the spending um, internally by corporate counsel. And the total is the spending in the United States on uh, legal affairs for companies that are a billion dollars or more in revenue. Now, the increase is significant in that it's the first significant increase since the Great Recession of 2008-2009, but perhaps more interestingly, with a direct impact on law firms, is these new high-risk matters created by the uncertainty. This amount is growing. These are all new matters which have come into the marketplace or the portfolio of these large clients. They are selecting law firms to help them manage these high-risk matters created by uncertainty. And right now, this is probably one of the most attractive opportunities for law firms as it is one of the biggest concerns and headaches of clients. So as we look at this and we go through and we find this will be the opportunity where um, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about where and how clients are behaving, what they're looking for, and what that means for individual markets. Now, we like to display the different practices in the marketplace according to its growth and its rate pressure that clients are willing to pay or apply to different practice areas. This line running down the middle of this chart is the average rate in the marketplace. Anything to the right is going to get a premium rate and clients are willing to pay premium rates. Anything to the left is more routine, more every day, and that is going to be under more price pressure. As we've looked at this over the years, the dichotomy between the rates of their clients will pay premiums for and those that they're going to apply rate pressure is growing. There's a bigger gap because the new matters coming into the market demand higher rates. They demand more spending. So client budgets are not increasing as much as clients needs in this high risk area. So you're seeing more pressure in the places where they can apply it. Now, when we start with the rate pressure, we look to the right, 
Then we look at this blue dotted line running across the chart right here. This is the projected market growth rate. So anything above this line, the practice areas will be getting new incremental dollars. Anything below will be shrinking or not getting nearly the amount of dollars that the growing practices will. And that immediately starts to impact our marketing and business development strategy because if we're going to take business away, which we've been doing for the last nine years, it's going to be a slightly different strategy to go out and grab new spending, and especially in some of the high growth areas where client demands have changed. Now, each circle represents a pocket of spending in each practice. So you can see you've got bet the company litigation, M&A, cybersecurity, you've got restructuring and bankruptcy investigations. Each one is a different size with the reference circle being about a billion in spending. For reference purposes, litigation is about $22 billion or so. So that'll give you a sense of overall um, how big each individual practice is. So when we go and we look at these practices, we're going to see a couple of things. First, the biggest or growing practice is cybersecurity and data privacy, well above anything else. Now, I think it's important to point out when we made this prediction, which we still very clearly believe in and think is right on target, it was before the Marriott breach. So all the Marriott breach is bring up the urgency, bring up the ability to spend, to find the budget dollars. It's also made clients more selective. They really want to see where the law firms they're talking to have real experience, real knowledge, what they know, because they've seen a lot of firms bring in high-profile laterals and be able to make a lot of claims, but they really want to see that deep experience or else learn a lot of things they don't already know. Right now, you can see, um, as well as being the fastest growing, it's also one of the practices that's getting the highest rates. That shouldn't be a surprise given the depth and the um, far-reaching consequences of any kind of breach. So this market will continue to grow. Uh, clients believe that there isn't not necessarily enough supply to meet the demand, so there's a scarcity factor going on, and this gives law firms a lot of opportunity to go in, educate clients, and really establish themselves um, alongside some other firms that have done a good job of, of establishing a beachhead, but uh, clients are still looking around for those kind of that can help them with the new challenges as they see it, especially in light of GDPR, which is, was expected. But again, the Marriott breach has had a big impact in terms of what is a reasonable standard, what should they be doing if a nation state is the one that's doing the breaching and the hacking. The next largest and fastest growing practice is mergers and acquisitions. And this market really has two lives to it. The first life is around large scale acquisitions. You're seeing them in pharma, you're seeing them in food, and you'll continue to see them. Uh, we expect a couple in tech. Um, these are really the vehicles by which large companies are looking to grow in many cases, especially in industries where it's an overall slow growth rate. The second half of the market is in the middle of the market. Um, large companies have just learned that acquiring these smaller companies that may bring a technology, it may bring a product, it may bring market access, it, it can bring a plethora of advantages to help drive a very large company's growth, which they couldn't get otherwise. This trend has been going on for about five years in a row, which shows absolutely no sign of stopping. So for large firms or mid-sized firms that are chasing large and mega deals, this is very good news. For the firms that are interested in mid-sized deals, um, this is also good news. It's how to get um, the companies that find themselves for sale, but also We've seen a number of mid-sized law firms develop some very good relationships, especially with companies based outside the United States. They've made trips to various cities in Asia and the United uh, in Europe, 
uh, South America, and they've established relationships with companies who want to make acquisitions in the United States and are guiding them through the process. So these firms were clever enough to go out to the very source before anyone made any decisions about what they're going to buy and where and position themselves to get the work. Doesn't mean there's not a lot of work still out there, but that's one of the most effective strategies that we have seen. Then we move over to IP litigation. IP litigation defies logic a little bit because the number of matters and number of companies that are actually uh, reporting or projecting IP litigation for the coming year is going down, but the amount of money that they plan to spend is going up. That says that these matters are getting more complex. That says that these matters are having more financial exposure and exposure to the business. They're becoming higher profile. They're getting the attention of top management. And these, again, are, uh, have a, a large degree of uncertainty because these companies rely in many cases on core technology, which may be subject to litigation and they're kind of standing out, everyone within a company is watching, and that's why they're commanding the higher rates than they have in the past. Then we're gonna move over to class actions. And as we look at class actions, to me this is always interesting since we presented this webinar so many times. When we first started presenting the webinar, class action was down here under tremendous price pressure and over the years has kind of grown to be one of the uh, faster growing practices and also one of those practices that has been able to command premium rates. And the reason for the premium rates is that first, the class actions are getting more complex. Second is the exposures that companies have when they're looking at the, um, the risk and looking what they might have to pay out as a result of a class action is the highest it's ever been. Um, in prior years, we've heard about, you know, it started at billions, it went up to tens of billions. Now we're hearing companies talk about potential exposure um, between 50 and $70 billion, and in some cases, even more. So clients are really taking a hard look at class actions. They're being selective in who they hire. Um, and they are willing to pay much higher rates than they have been in the past. Now, part of the reason the class action has become so high on exposure has to do with this bubble here, this litigation. What's happening is part of the complexity is really coming from different aspects of some of the markets that we've talked about. So if a company has a breach, a client has a breach, they can expect litigation on a number of fronts. Um, they can expect some uh, regulatory action that is going to come immediately towards them. They can expect a class action because the plaintiffs are going to assert that, of course, you should have known about this, and um, therefore everyone in the class would be damaged. And the securities litigators are going to come in and assert that you should have known this, disclosed this, and therefore there has been an unreasonable harm to the stock price. Now this is going on um, with IP litigation. This is going on in various aspects, also and especially in investigations. It's attracting multiple lawsuits. So what used to be a single litigation has now turned into a litigation that might have as many as two, three, four different litigations attracted or attached on. Um, we referred to this two years ago as the pile-on effect. Litigation begets litigation begets litigation. This is what's one of the things that's driving the uncertainty in addition to things like tariffs and uh, geopolitics and um, the instability in our government and another, another government shutdown that might happen in three weeks. Add all these things up. If you're a client, you've got a tremendous amount of uncertainty that you're trying to manage, project, and otherwise um, diminish the exposures that you have. Now, there's also been one other big change. This is the number of cases that clients have been able to settle. Now, we reached a peak here in 2017, um, and you can see it was about 61%. In 2018, that took a very precipitous dive down to 44%. 
and clients are projecting that's 38 percent now what clients will tell you about settling a matter is first of all it reduces their risk so they're pretty happy about that they're spending on legal fees stops because you don't have a matter anymore and it's a great risk management tool so if i can settle a matter i know what the cost is i know what my risk is and i'm able to project where i go next and deal with my new matters now that i'm settling less matters as a client all of a sudden i have to spend more i don't know exactly what my exposure is because i can't cap it through a settlement and with the shrinking amount of settlements, all that does is add to the uncertainty, add to the spending, and puts on kind of new pressure that hasn't been there, probably going back about you know seven, eight, maybe even nine years. So all these things are adding to the uncertainty. And then finally, if you don't believe me, look at how many clients are reporting high stakes litigations. From the period of 2017 to 2018, this number has more than doubled. So no matter how you look at it, no matter how you put this together, you've got a lot of really kind of complex, high risk, high financial exposure. And the more financial exposure you have, the more interested people like CFOs, boards, and CEOs are. So not only does this uncertainty make the legal and decision-making process difficult for clients, it now increases the pressure for them to report more, more status, more progress on a regular basis to people outside the litigation department. They may have to disclose some of these things. So no matter how you look at it, it is adding several layers of complexity to clients who are looking for help. Now, when we talk to clients and you kind of ask them about this, we still find that 70% of clients want to tell their outside counsel about all these things and what law firms can do to improve through client feedback, but only 38% or so are asking in a meaningful way. So this leaves a gap of about 32, 34%, maybe a little bit higher, depending on how you count. Some of the feedback isn't asking about these things. So you've got a whole lot of clients that are feeling like their law firms really don't necessarily understand. They haven't changed their behavior. They haven't increased their level of urgency to be able to express that they understand and want to help reduce and limit the risk. And this is one of the big gaps in the marketplace that we're seeing today. This is also the reason the firms with really good client feedbacks are getting five times the revenue from a single client, that is five times the, from an average client, five times the fees than those that don't. Because those that are engaging with clients they're learning about these changes. The firms that have been engaging in client feedback on a multi-year basis have been able to see this evolve. And as they've seen it evolve, they've been able to change. They've changed the, what they're offering to clients. They've changed how they dialogue with clients. And as a result, they're getting the lion's share of that new money that we talked about that's coming into the marketplace. So it's one more tool that clients are relying on to figure out who's going to help them with the most complex work, which is really the meat and potatoes of what almost every law firm that we meet says where they want to be. That's where the right now, that's where the biggest fees are, the least price pressure. So this is not only a strong fee stream from a client, it's usually a higher margin fee stream because you're getting better rates. So this is becoming more and more important as clients are increasing their risk and facing bigger exposures. Now, when we start getting into things like client feedback, it's important to put the whole role of client feedback and client service into perspective. Generally speaking, clients will put client feedback in the context of client focus. So if you're looking, it's going to be right in here. 
for those of you, and there's many, many, many of you on uh, the call today that have seen this before, these are the 17 activities driving client relationships. This is what clients rely on when they evaluate and hire a law firm. A brief refresher, the activities in the lower right are the price of admission. These are the minimum requirements. If you can't bring the legal skill and quality and handle problems and meet their core scope, then there's no basis for a relationship. And those are the things that are just, you know, fundamental. If those aren't there, any relationship will just deteriorate. Now, when we look at that, we all know that legal skills are the single most important thing on here. But if we take a look, the second most important thing on here is actually commitment to help. And what we find is when we look at commitment to help, what's different is this is the importance and legal skills are the single most important thing on here. But clients are quick to point out that just because something important, it doesn't necessarily differentiate a law firm. So we went back out and asked, well, which activities do and by how much? So the higher the activity is above this line, the more it differentiates you from everybody else. And more importantly, not only does it differentiate you from everybody else, it brings more value. And as it brings more value, of course, that translates into higher rates for you and it gets you hired. So as we look at this, we spend a lot of time working on these four activities, which are gonna be the single most influential in any client decision to hire you for the new complex work or any other work that they have. Now, we talked about commitment to help, which is your ability to match a client's urgency. Do you want to help them accomplish their goal? And right now, this is a big challenge, as I mentioned, because clients are telling us that law firms, they're certainly trying, they're committed, but they don't have that urgency for the new complex work. They're not changing. They're not bringing in bigger teams. They're not changing out the attorneys that they use. They're not taking new approaches. So those are signs that the new urgency is being met value for the dollar we've talked about for a long time. This is not low rates. If you look at our national studies in the A-team, those that get the highest rates um, are the ones generally that bring the best value for the dollar because clients are looking at a term they use in IT all the time, and that's total cost. They use total cost of ownership. We're using total cost of resolution. By the time I'm done, if I spend more, I may just get a better outcome or I may be able to settle faster. And that doesn't mean necessarily I go to the biggest firms because we know some mid-sized firms and smaller firms who are able to present the team that can scale up in case there's a real problem that arises. So it doesn't have to be a mega firm, but it has to be a firm that can scale. Client focus is the ability to understand and target a client's real core target issues. One of them, as we've talked about ad nauseum, is this idea of uncertainty. They want to tell you about it. But right now, also understanding the client's business keeps increasing importance. Every single time you see more exposure, what clients believe is that the more exposure the more understanding you need of their business. Because if you can understand the business risk, then you can understand the financial exposure. That understanding will help your clients explain this to their management and will convince them that you can manage this risk better than anyone else. Now, while I'm talking, I'm sure that everybody has been studying this to see what else has changed. Well, for those of you that are wondering and have already figured it out, what we've learned this year is deals with complexity is now an attribute of client service. There are some law firms that look at complexity and as one corporate counsel put it, they wanna study it all day long. They wanna look at every single component before they issue an opinion. And what clients say is, you said to me, you've been doing this for you know, 15 years, 20 years, you've seen this before, you made this pitch where you said you see these kinds of matters all the time, yet you won't give me a combination of your experience, what you've observed before, and what you think might be the outcome 
unless you go and spend weeks, if not more, doing the research to try to figure out what the complexity might be. So this is a little bit of a challenge for some law firms while others embrace it and they really want to get out there. What this replaces is regional reputation. And what clients are saying is, sure, law firms are branded, they're still branded, some have good brands, some have better brands than others, but most of the time at this juncture, they know the law firms that are out there, so it's no longer necessarily an active part of client service. What it does is it becomes separate impacting the hiring decision, your ability to get rates, but in terms of client service, it doesn't set the same expectation that it used to. We believe this to be a fairly significant change because now clients are looking for something different. And as you'll remember, the three activities down here are really business magnets. Now, many people think that because these are the most important, the opposite quadrant would be the least important. But due to some statistical anomalies, the, there's a group of clients, about 15 to 20%, that only want to buy on price. And when they only buy on price, something interesting happens. They don't care about these things. So that means that 85% of the market, who are the ones that don't buy on price, care about these kinds of things. And not only that, will seek out the law firms that they believe will bring these things, whether through direct experience, indirect experience, uh, referrals, whenever they think they're gonna get a more innovative approach that you're gonna anticipate their needs, that you can deal with the complexity that's facing them or more, they're going to seek you out. Once they seek you out, they're going to expect these four activities to lead the way. But these influence business development and are starting to really play a role in how clients not only measure your expectations and your service, but how they're going to select you for the next matter and not put it out for bid through an RFP. And we're going to talk about some of this in a few more minutes. Now, as you know, every year we go out and we ask corporate counsel at least 350 which law firm is absolutely best at those 17 activities. We provide no names, we provide no prompts, we provide no suggestions. As many of you also know, we do not accept payment, we do not accept referrals, we do not accept submissions, suggestions on who to talk to. It's completely independent. We now spread the survey out over roughly a 10 month period to minimize any specific event or also minimize the ability to impact. And what you've got is about 650 law firms that are competing for business with companies in the U.S. that have a billion dollars or more in revenue, and 30 stand out as absolutely best. Not only do they stand out as absolutely best, but they are somewhere between 9 and 15 times better than the average law firm. And there's a couple of things that make this unique. One is Jones Day, which has been number one at least uh, 11 different times. Um, Jones Day and um, uh, Morgan Lewis and Sidley are the only three firms that have been on this list for 19 years in a row. I'd like you to think about exactly what that means for a minute. That means that the firms have been able to change, recognize when clients change, go through different cycles of needs, large spending, small spending, cutbacks, increases, and still deliver the best client service. Law firms that also do that, Skadden's been on this list 10 years, Latham has been on this list for 12 years, um, Hogan has been on this list for seven years, and we could go through, but every single firm that is on here, McGuire Woods has been on here 13 times, Greenberg Charg has been on here 10 times, um, you can see that there's a pattern developing. And one of them is that once these firms are figuring out how to deliver superior client service, they keep investing in it. They don't just sit back and say, okay, this is awesome, We've, we're really good at this. Every year, they're working to get better. Every year, they're investing. 
for these firms, if you went in and we asked them and uh, we got them to be really honest on a in a public forum, they would tell you that this is not an effort du jour for these firms. This is not an annual program. It is an ongoing program. Many of these firms, it is a strategic goal. The amount of clients that recommend them, the number of clients that score them in the BTI Client Service 30, the scores that they get, the scores they get on the 17 activities, all are part of the strategic plan. And then they include activities for individual attorneys, mostly partners, to um, drive these superior scores. They don't just happen. So the key there is they have gone systematic, meaning that they're not only providing, quote, support, but they are providing support to a wide range of partners to help them understand what clients are looking for, what clients want, and the behaviors that clients are looking for. These firms provide tools, thought leadership. Um, they provide training in how to discuss these things, how to get client feedback. They're engaging in client feedback initiatives. All these things over time are showing that it keeps you in the vanguard of client service. Now, if you were going to ask me to single out the six things that these firms are doing that others aren't, I would point to the following things. One, these firms do very well in managing complexity, in dealing with complexity, the new um, client service attribute. While many firms think about it, these firms, even if they're thinking about it, clients tell us they think about it with the client. They'll brainstorm about it. They'll try to sort it out. They'll dive right in. They don't feel the need to you know, prepare for three months or a week or whatever it might be before they discuss it with the client. They come in. They bring their experience. They bring in other attorneys. They bring in teams to discuss the complexity, the uncertainty, and what it means. They also do things like provide checklists, assessments, guidelines that they actually give to the client. And when the client can use these on their own, they'll know when to pick up the phone to ask questions and when they're kind of okay or when they can kind of assess things or monitor things as they move along. But the combination of thinking things through with clients and providing these checklists, guides, and assessments and other tools is viewed as a great act of client service one that very few, many law firms have checklists. Very few law firms take these checklists out, deliver them to clients personally, and review the checklists and ask for the results. So it's a question of what you do with it as much as having these things. Number two is having scalable teams when things get ugly. And that really speaks to can you scale up if a regulator shows up, if we get hit with a class action, if all these things happen in a proximate time frame, can you bring a team together to do this? And again, I want to emphasize there are numerous mid-sized firms that have proven that they can scale. They can provide a team of 8, 10, 12 attorneys. You don't have to be a mega firm, but there's so many firms that can't, it makes the firms who can scale look like they're much more committed that they're ready to dive in. This gives clients a lot of comfort. It makes them feel like they're dealing with complexity and they're prepared. The new and deeper understanding, well, I think we've kind of hit that. Um, it's the business risk. Clients want to understand the business risk. And it's kind of interesting because you don't have to understand all the operating details of your client. You just need to understand what the key risks are and how they impact the client. What is the one or two unique kind of pieces of information that will give you that business risk? And most of the time, clients will tell you if you ask them. So that gets back to this idea of client dialogue. Just going back to the scalability, one really interesting thing a couple of law firms are doing is they are placing attorneys on standby. They're actually introducing these attorneys to the client. They are being briefed on a regular basis on kind of one or two pieces of litigation. But should things scale up, they know the client knows there's a team and the client is happy to pay for this standby team. 
early assessments, early case assessments, is getting even earlier and earlier, and that's really a subset of number one, using these guides, using the interview process, using the dialogue process. Now, number five, secondments. We, we have a lot of discussion with law firms about secondments because clients love them, and <coughs> what I hear back oftentimes is, well, that's really setting me up to lose a great associate. That might be the case, but the chances are when you talk to the associates, this was an associate who unfortunately was probably looking for something else at some point anyway, but usually if it's a great client, they will be worth the risk. Secondments are great because you will learn the new and deeper understanding just by having somebody there. You're gonna learn all the different things that you need to learn about that particular client. You'll probably get insight into when there's a problem and can help manage the complexity. Maybe the associate doesn't have the skill or experience to manage it, but they do have the skill and experience to call someone at the firm and say, hey, I think there might be an issue here. And then finally, <coughs> one of the things that's really standing out is innovation. And we hear so much about innovation and we hear it from law firms who think about innovation so differently than clients do. And this is why this idea of custom innovation becomes so important. Clients have a view of what innovation is, and when they have a view, and each one has a slightly different view, the only vehicle to understand that, especially for your largest clients, is to talk to them about it. What is it they really want? What would be different to them? What have they seen? What have they learned? What would they like to emulate? What have they seen that they would like to make better? Well, this is one of the things that's starting to really also separate the BTI Client Service 30 from everybody else. So innovation, you'll remember, was in the lower right hand, lower left hand quadrant, um, is now playing a bigger role in separating the BTI Client Service 30 and every other law firm in in the uh, realm of client service as well. Now, we hear a lot, um, I mean, a lot about how law firms are not innovative, how law firms don't bring innovation. Well, the improvement, the good news is, is that law firms are getting better, they're getting stronger at innovation. If you asked law firms to rank uh, rather clients to rank law firm innovation. In 2014, on a scale of one to 10, they ranked the typical law firm a 6.6, which would you know, still be a failing grade. In 2018, that number has gone up by 10.6% and is now a 7.3. So it's not exactly taking a um, you know, rocket ship fast path but the important thing is, is that firms are getting better, they are trying harder, and clients are recognizing it despite everything you read that says that there's no innovation. So the question is, how do you position yourself to leapfrog this so you can get more business, so you can differentiate yourself, so that you can really place yourself in a position where you are not only delivering the other attributes of client service, but you're being more innovative. And again, what we found is part of that is bringing the client into the process, but we will talk about that again um, before we close out today's webinar. Now, we went through and as part of a very large survey of clients, of top legal decision makers, we asked them who, which law firms by name were the real innovators in their mind. No prompting, no suggestions, just who really impressed them. And we asked about it on two fronts. The first is the innovation front, which means that clients are doing something new different that clients haven't seen before, but doesn't necessarily have to have a technology component. Then we asked specifically about technology. And there we started to get different answers. Ultimately, 
innovation and technology will come together. So you can see if you can impress clients and with both your technology and your innovation, you end up here being one of the change agents, that you're defining the path. You are going to be the standard against which all other law firms are uh, compared when it comes to innovation technology and making things different. Also, it's going to drive your client's service performance. Now, clients identified about 3% of law firms as the true change agents. These are the firms that are able to harness technology. They're bringing innovative approaches that clients like, find valuable. So if 3% of the firms can do it, and we've got others that are close, it's kind of interesting that you've got the early adopters that are kind of starting to get some recognition for their technology, but very high in the innovation. We expect these to end up over here. You've got um, a small group of law firms, for those of you who are race car fans, who are what we call riding the drag. That is, um, they are behind the change agents, they're doing innovative things, but they're not doing them on the scale where they're being recognized like the change agents are. So we expect these riding the drag to move up this way as well. Now, you may have noticed that 48% of law firms are invisible. Clients don't see any technology that's meaningful. They don't see any innovation that's meaningful. This doesn't mean that these law firms aren't doing anything. What it means is clients aren't noticing it. They may not notice it for a couple of reasons. One is they may have seen it before and it's innovative to the law firm, but it's not innovative to the client. The other is it may be innovative, but it just doesn't make an impact. It doesn't change the client's life. It doesn't make their life easier. So clients just don't consider it as uh, something they recognize as innovative. You've got another 34% as almost invisible. So they're getting some traction. Um, they're starting to see some results. Hopefully at least half of these firms will end up moving at least this way. Uh, the other half will probably, you know, experience says has some trouble. So, um, you know, you've got roughly 70 some odd percent of law firms not really getting the recognition and you've got the others kind of spread out here, um, kind of taking the early lead, not just in innovation, but getting all the other benefits of getting new business and the things that come with it. We've got this small group of stealth. They're not really being recognized for the things that they do, but we expect they will because they've got more meaning. Um, we expect these to be up here as well. And eventually, you know, there's going to be a group of law firms that um, manage to pull these two together or go to the extreme of one or the other that is way out here in technology or way out here in innovation and they'll start to make a name for themselves and will naturally find themselves gravitating to the other ways. But the point of all this is clients are noticing the impact of these innovation and use of technology. They see it as differentiators. They see it as something that they value, something that they want, and this is worth investing in because you've already got law firms making investments and making an impact with these clients. Now, once we got done um, asking clients who was good at all the different aspects of innovation and all the different aspects of technology, out of the 650, there were 52 that really stood out. And as you look at it, Morgan Lewis is number one. What clients said is Morgan Lewis seemed to have the most integrated approach. You can go to any part of Morgan Lewis and you could find innovation, you can find innovation through technology, and not only that, but Morgan Lewis, the same is true at Seifarth, they were just not only comfortable talking about it, but they were excited to be talking about it. They thought the innovation was just great. There was a large swath of clients who knew about it, who could talk about it, who experienced it. Whereas if you move outside of the 52, 
you start seeing individual acts of innovation or individual acts of technology. So what we've learned both from client service and from innovation is that rogue acts of greatness or rogue acts of innovation, rogue acts of client service can't compete with systematic acts of innovation, of client service, of technology. And this is starting to be a theme. And again, whether you're a mid-sized firm, a large firm, or a small firm, the idea of introducing these things across the firm so that all clients see them, A, gives you the real benefit, gets everybody in the firm comfortable with it, and will get you enough feedback from clients where you actually can start improving on what you've done because it's going to be a two-way street. So what I want to do is share with you, based on our uh, research, we came up with actually 27 different sets of needs. We did a needs analysis with clients, um, which was available in our innovation and technology review. I wanted to share the top seven. So when you go out and you talk to clients, you ask them, okay, what's your biggest, you know, kind of pain point? What's your biggest need? What is it that you'd really like to solve? The first thing we heard about, which is decidedly basic, is access to current and historical documents. What they said is AI may be great, it's very exciting, but I need access to my documents. And I'm just talking about the documents from last month. I'm talking about all the years I might have been working with you. I want to go to one place. I want to see them. I want to be able to review them. I want to pick from them. I want to use them as templates. I want, want to use them as reference points. Um, I might need them for a uh, executive or another deal that I'm doing, but this is critical. And they're having trouble putting together. And I have to emphasize they not only want access, but they want access in a client-friendly manner. One firm built this for a client, but didn't name the documents using traditional naming conventions. They used client numbers instead, so the client had no idea what each document was. It may not be a surprise, but dashboards with budget status, timelines, and other key performance indicators as defined by the client is number two. Remote access through apps and cloud-based technology. Now, number four is important. Sometimes the first three things don't work. Sometimes it's not obvious how they work. So they wanted a place to call. They wanted a place to go to learn and ask questions on how to access some of these things. Now, when you start moving to number five, you start to see some of the things we read about when we think of legal technology. Uh, contract development and management tools, which is kind of AI-based, which can keep uh, paragraphs or clauses or subclauses of different contracts in one place. Uh, Chase has gained a lot of um, press around this for using a, a system like this, where you answer a few basic questions and you come up with the core contract. Attorneys will have to interface to customize it, but you'll get the bulk of it right through this and will also manage it for anything you might have to worry about in the future. Then you've got changes in workflow. And then finally, number seven, you get into some kind of artificial or augmented intelligence. What we hear about is things like um, uh, automated uh, case research where you put in certain information and it will come back with um, the most relevant citations first, cutting days off the time to do research and other similar kinds of applications. But uh, there's 27 in total we uncovered. These are the top seven. And I think the message that I would take away in looking at this is that much of it is about blocking and tackling. And if you look at the very successful tech firms that are known as disruptors and first to market, they started with the blocking and tackling. And that's where law firms are now is how do you kind of engage with clients around their core needs so that you can position yourself to help them with the more advanced needs as we move forward. Now, 
there's two things to understand about how the innovators differentiate themselves. First, they are asking clients about their needs and obstacles. So this is a different form of client feedback. Client feedback nonetheless. Many are using dedicated individuals who do not practice law and do nothing other than this. They go out and they talk to clients about what they want. They find the commonalities. They're able to help guide the development of the tools and the innovation, especially in the technology arena. They keep the dialogue going. Clients love to talk to these individuals. Sometimes firms will use third parties, but the important thing is they are engaging with clients. It's a two-way street, and it's probably not a surprise to learn that of the 52 innovation champions we saw a couple of minutes ago, 24 are on the BPI Client Service 30. Seven of the top 10 are also in the BPI Client Service 30. So you're starting to see innovation as an active client service. And no matter where we go in the analysis, we keep hearing about it and seeing about it. We think it's going to play a bigger role as we move forward in the marketplace. So with that, I'd like to leave you with six recommendations to get more business, to get improved client service, and to get some of that new high margin work that's out there. First, use a SWAT team approach to developing clients. This is one of the more innovative things that we've seen. There's at least five law firms out there, and they're not all mega firms, that have taken their best business developers, or they've taken another group and trained them in how to go out and talk to clients about specific types of matters, usually the very complex matters that clients are so concerned about. They have had their billable hour targets cut. That's right, they're not billing as much time, but they are going out and developing clients on a national and international scale. That's their job, that's their role. They've abolished or changed their credit system to make this work in their firms. And I can tell you that every firm that has developed a SWAT team is developing more business with the bigger clients than they ever dreamed of. It wouldn't be a BTI webinar if we didn't say get feedback from every major client about their new uncertainty and risk. The more you ask, the more you will understand, the more opportunity that you will have. Adopt the risk management tools to help clients develop certainty around their uncertainty. These are the checklists, the assessments, the guidelines. Every single law firm on this call today can gather a group of clients and ask what the biggest risk clients face in a given area. So you would say, what's the biggest risk in cybersecurity? What's the biggest risk in IP litigation? What's the biggest risk in an investigation? Have every partner write the three biggest risks on three separate pieces of post-it note. Take those post-it notes, put it on the wall, ask the partners to prioritize them. Then I want every marketing and business development department to grab those in order and create a checklist for clients. It'll take the partners a half hour and you've got one of the most powerful tools that you could possibly have. Engage with clients, talk to them about their strategy, talk to them about what they're gonna do, especially those with large litigation portfolios. When you're pitching, whether you're meeting with a client, show that you can develop into scale and have a team. For years and years and years, especially mid-sized firms have gone into clients and say, you know, we're smaller and cheaper. We're smaller, but we're the same quality. Well, clients don't want small for small sake anymore. They want to know they have a team. They have no problem working with a smaller firm who has a team because there are large firms that don't have anything resembling a team. So your ability to scale and talk and work as a team is going to be the difference between getting hired for the complex work and not getting hired for the complex work. And then finally, Embrace real, impactful and innovation you can scale. It's great to do something for a client here. It's great, great to do something for a client there. But the more that you can string those together, the more you can get scale, the more places you can do the same kinds of things, the better you're going to get at it, 
the more impact it's going to have and the more it's going to differentiate you in a world where fewer law firms are being differentiated and the ones that aren't are having a harder time getting business. Well, this has been, um, you know, for me, uh, one of the more exciting webinars that we've presented. Um, I think the activity around innovation has really um, changed the landscape or has the ability and changing the definition of client service and changing business development because it's one of the things that clients are looking for. So we certainly hope you enjoyed the discussion around client service, around the opportunities in the market and client service. Um, Jennifer Dizo and I both welcome your questions. You're welcome to call us. You're welcome to email us. I hope you're all enjoying the Mad Clientist, the BTI blog, and I really appreciate everyone joining us this afternoon and look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you so much.